Hi, Dan Tix here again with Keystone Retaining Walls, coming to you with our Tech Talk video number five on retaining wall uh, drainage applications. And what this will talk about is uh, how to handle uh, water from various sources in uh, in and around a retaining wall, whether it's surficial flow, uh, embankment flow, and groundwater flow into uh, the retaining wall system. Um, hope you enjoy, and uh, hopefully we'll be getting out and seeing you all soon. Thank you. Water can compromise a structure from many different sources. Water is also the number one enemy of retaining walls. And so what we're going to look at today is where are those sources of water and how can we prevent them from uh, infiltrating the wall reinforced zone and stop the water penetration locations. Here we have our locations that we're going to look at. First, we're going to talk about the basic drainage component of the retaining walls. And this is for a majority of your site conditions. That will be location one. Um, it's also sort of a system component with a lot of the retaining walls, uh, especially with cord uh, unit systems. Second location we're going to look at is surface runoff, right? Um, uh, how do we handle some of that surface runoff? It would be location three. Um, location four will be embankment flow, right? Uh, what's behind the retaining wall. And finally, location five, where we have groundwater conditions that are coming up from the base of the retaining walls. So our first one we're looking at is the drainage aggregate, right? Um, that's what's included in the actual retaining wall block themselves and typically one foot behind the retaining wall block if you have a, a, a 12 inch deep unit. So here's an example of that, right? This is actually an 18 inch deep unit. So the zone behind the block is actually going to be a little bit less than that because we want to have essentially a two foot zone from face of wall to end of drainage material. And there's a couple of reasons for that, right? It provides free draining material at the face, uh, the non-frost susceptible material. It also can prevent soil fines from washing through the face with proper filter design. We utilize a clean crushed stone, typically a, a number 67 or number 57 stone, right? Um, because it requires little compaction to achieve density. Uh, improves the placement and compaction of soil close to the face. And in some systems, it improves the connection capacity. A lot of times you might actually see where, where do we apply a geotextile filter fabric. And in many cases, it's not necessarily necessary. Um, but in certain applications, certain water applications, you should be utilizing a geotextile to prevent fines from washing into that. And we'll talk a little bit uh, about that later on. So what is our drainage aggregate, right? Well, that's typically a clean crushed stone, right? And there's no fines to it, right? Uh, typically uh, less than 5%, um, even on the number 50, right? But it's less than 5% fines, right? It's just a stone. Um, this allows water to, to percolate through the material very freely, right? Water goes where it wants to go. And these are uniformly graded stones um, with some slight variation to the size. But like I said, we typically prefer a 57 or 67 stone to be used as core fill and for the drainage zone behind the retaining wall face. Oftentimes a, um, a, a drainage pipe will be specified and this can be located as we've shown here um, at the base of the wall, or it can be shown as sort of a raised drain detail. Uh, typically, these details require, you know, we want to place a filter fabric in the stone around the pipe, not necessarily over the pipe, right? Like a silt sock um, over the actual drainage pipe themselves, because we have different styles of pipes that we utilize, but we don't want the filter fabric to become clogged, right? Because it's stopping the fines. If it's directly over the pipe, then the fines clog the fabric and block water from getting into the pipe as needed. Right, our pipe should always maintain positive drainage, um, and that's either to daylight, so it's just draining out to the surface, we call it daylight, or to storm drains. Um, when we don't have storm drains, we should have an outlet drainage pipe every 30 to 50 feet on center, and 
outletting maybe if it's going to daylight maybe the ends of the wall for short walls right and it's coming out the sides of the wall and coming out to grade somewhere alternatively you know we can utilize these sort of raised drain situations and what we end up utilizing is a um, dense graded aggregate here a well compacted aggregate right behind um, the face the unit face here so what that does is it actually traps the water so that it stays at the pipe level so that we can get it out of the system right so we're we're um, putting in the uh, the dense graded aggregate throughout and below the geogrid and directing water right to that pipe um, uh, it is typically when we don't have a storm sewer system and daylighting is uh, easier for like if it's a level bottom, right? We don't have a, a slope at the sides of the wall or something where we can outlet that pipe when it's down here. The sub drainage, so it collects and diverts subsurface water away from the SRW system and minimizes water pressure buildup, right? Uh, typically, these pipes are around four inches in diameter, sometimes a larger diameter pipe will be specified typically with perforated pipes uh, the filter fabric generally is to segregate the reinforced fill from our drainage aggregate right we we can have a variety of uh, reinforced fills here um, anywhere up to 35 percent fines which we've talked about previously and so you know what happens if we have water that's either not collected back here or below or something or we have some infiltration from a rain event those fines kind of get carried through with the water particles and so we want to um, block those fines from clogging up our drainage system right so um, it allows for the continued free flow of water through the drainage system but prevents us uh, the fines movement right um, primarily this geotextile should be a non-woven fabric um, no silt film should be utilized, no silt fence behind that. And you should always follow Ashtil M288 and the design plans for what is required for the geotextile fabric behind um, the drainage aggregate. Um, it will typically and more than likely recommended to be installed in full on water applications, right? And we're actually going to talk about that in our next Tech Talk series, water applications. But we kind of had to give you guys the basis for for um, sort of the actual drainage system designs in our retaining walls. Um, and the geotextile fabric ends up being sort of a separation and confinement layer, right? All right, on to locations two and three, um, you know, where we're gonna talk about surface runoff and drainage and surface infiltration. Um, and this is rather pretty simple, actually, you know, um, a lot of times our walls are designed with back slopes in mind or right graded to the top of the wall. And so when we are, um, you know, where we don't have a lot of rainfall and things like that, we just put in a layer of uh, uh, eight inch low permeability soil, right? Graded flush to the cap. And as water either soaks in and infiltrates or it's a small amount of surface runoff, then it just kind of flows where it needs to flow, right? Can go get caught down in our drainage layer. That's why we have it behind the block. Um, and it sort of just naturally takes care of itself. Um, when we have higher, where we have sort of high areas of rain, where we have very low permeable soil everywhere, um, this is where a drainage swell application might be necessary, right? We're gonna take a look at putting in some type of swale to direct the water flow where we want it to go. So uh, whether that's directed to an inlet or stormwater system, um, you must be able to have some grading uh, changes at the top of the wall right where this is applicable um, and we take that water away um, this drainage swale should be a flexible pavement style system or grass line swale something that can move right because we're, we're dealing with soil systems that shift and move and one of the great things about it our wall systems is a flexible nature and allowing that however if we have sort of a rigid style um swale what it tends to happen is you can get intermittent cracking and breaking as the soil moves and therefore the water does it, it doesn't um it can get into those cracks and things like that whereas if you have a fle more flexible style you're limiting the amount of cracking and things that can um uh, allow the water to go where we don't want it to go Next, we're going to take a look at our embankment and groundwater flow. And first, we're going to deal with sort of this bank embankment area, right? Um, 
Um, and what, what we end up tending to do there is we want to put in some type of chimney drain, we call it, a, almost a vertical drain. We go back and take a look at this. And what we're doing is we're actually intercepting the water before it enters our reinforced zone. And that's the key point with all of this is, is we really don't want water to enter this zone, right? If we can prevent it from getting here, we have our backup system in place here to prevent hydrostatic buildup. But if we can intercept the, the water system or the water detail uh, that's coming into the system from back here, that's always best. And so sometimes you'll see these details on plans where we're, we're trying to catch that water, okay? Um, and this is where our groundwater flows laterally. It could be a perched water. It could be a sand layer within a cohesion zone or some type of sand layer in a rock zone behind our cut, um, something along those lines. So the first option um, is sort of a chimney style drain, right? It's typically um, aggregate wrapped in filter fabric, uh, again, and with some type of drainage uh, uh, pipe down at the bottom, right? The second option is more of a, a, a you know, utilizing our, our new technologies that would be like a, what we call a drainage composite or a geomembrane style, where it's got sheets that are placed. Um, typically, they're, they're still to the 70% criteria, and they still have a, a drain that it outlets to, to to wick the water away. But what is what are some of the the, the similarities, what are some of the differences with these types of things? Well, both of them have a 70% wall height minimum criteria or to the height of the seabed, right? So you want to get a uh, cap, make sure you're capturing the entire water of the embankment. Um, and we set some minimum criteria for that because we just don't know what water is going to do, right? Um, an aggregate drain will be typically a 100% coverage along the wall, the entire wall length. Whereas uh, geocomposite might be, depending on the style of geocomposite, the size of it might have some type of coverage ratio. Um, you know, it could be anywhere between 30 or 100%, just depending on, you know, the zones of, of perch water in there. 50% um, coverage might be typical. So if you have a six foot wide drainage composite, you might see a six foot gap between it, right? Uh, between the next layer, something like that. But all of this is generally determined, you know, this, the scope of the geocomposite is determined by the site geotechnical engineer and their, their design. Um, aggregate, obviously, is the, the free draining aggregate. It's probably similar to our 67, uh, 57 stone. Uh, the filter fabric surrounds the drainage aggregate, whereas the filter fabric here is incorporated into the geocomposite. Both require a collector pipe. Um, but the the one thing is the difference in the installation techniques and and the various costs of the different material as well. So um, the the aggregate drain is being brought up in lifts with the as the retaining wall comes up, whereas the aggregate uh, or the geocomposite drain is installed in one piece, and they're just making sure as they backfill that they keep um, they doing things properly to protect the geocomposite drain. And finally, our last uh, location here, where groundwater. Um, generally, you know, we take a look at groundwater whenever it's within two thirds of a wall of the wall height uh, in the system, right? Or even within three feet of the base of the wall. And when I talk about the base of the wall, we're talking sort of this top of leveling pad. And um, what ends up happening is, is we put in some type of um, free draining aggregate wrapped in geotextile fabric with a drain in it. And what this does is this drain takes the water away and before it gets up into our retaining wall zone, right? Um, you know, the expected utilization when the groundwater table is expected to rise to or remains just below the leveling pad elevation during the design life of the structure, or it's a seasonal fluctuation, right? So it can rise and fall a few feet. Um, typically this is a site spe specific design by the geotechnical engineer. Uh, these blanket drains are generally a minimum six inches thick and wrapped in filter fabric, and they should outlet to a storm system or to daylight. Um, they can be thicker. They can be. Um, they might even be tied to, say, a, a foundation improvement because of the 
uh, high groundwater, right? So the geotechnical engineer might list this as a foundation improvement as well and come up with a whole uh, system maybe with reinforcement and drainage and things like that. So be sure to check out your design details when uh, accommodating those uh, features into your um, retaining wall foundations. So that concludes this tech talk. Um, look for our next talk, tech talk to be on water application, but uh, we thank you for your time. And as always, you can find more details or contact us through keystonewalls.com. Thank you.